Uh, and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. Happy to have you with us. Where do you want to start tonight? Uh, the prospect that we're about to shoot more missiles at Syria, right after the president said he wanted us to have nothing to do with the war in Syria anymore. We could start there. Um, there's also the fact that the president literally said today, get ready, Russia. That's a quote. Get ready, Russia. As he was apparently preparing his plans to shoot missiles into Syria, where Russia is the major organized military power on the ground. The president says, get ready, Russia, as in, here they come. You guys ready? Got everything moved out of the way? Do you need any more time? You good to go? This enough notice? Get ready, Russia. So we could start there tonight. Uh, we could start tonight with the X-rated report about alleged sexual abuse and violence by Missouri's Republican governor. Uh, that report just released tonight by the Missouri State Legislature. Um, and that governor still believes there is no need for him to step down. Uh, we can start there. We could start with yet more senior officials leaving the Trump administration. Uh, or we could start with the previously fired senior White House official who's now been brought back and installed on the president's orders at the Justice Department. We could start there. We could, we could start with the next new scoop that we've got on the Mueller investigation following our report last night on Dana Bente and James Comey. There is a lot going on, my fine feathered friends. I'm very glad that you're here. There's a lot to get through. Oh, and also the Speaker of the House, third in line to the presidency, resigned today. Uh, or at least he announced that he is leaving. Uh, he will not be running for re-election. Ho-hum, normal Wednesday. These are Wednesdays in our life now. Uh, the Republican Party has held the House of Representatives since the beginning of 2011. They won the chamber in the 2010 midterms, the big Tea Party wave. That was one of the biggest uh, partisan swings in the House in modern American history. Uh, the Republicans picked up 63 seats in that first midterm after President Obama was elected in the 2010 midterms. And when you, when you win a majority, even if it's just a small majority, you, of course, get to take control of all the committees in the House. You don't just get the leadership of the House at writ large. All the committees that had previously been chaired by Democrats, those Democratic chairs had to hand over their gavels to new Republican chairs. And, and when that sort of a transition happens, it is a feeding frenzy in Washington. It is power play writ large. There's lots of jockeying among members of Congress for the best jobs. Often the chairmanships are, are won by senior members of the House, people who've been around for a long time and have made a lot of friends and doled out a lot of favors, and they have a lot of chits to cash in with their colleagues. But when the Republicans took over the House with that big, big win in, in, in 2011, 2010 midterms, they're all getting sworn in in 2011, the Republican member of Congress who managed to snag the best chairmanship of all, the, the, the chairmanship of the Budget Committee, best gig in Congress, person who would be responsible for crafting the Republicans' economic alternative to President Obama's proposals. That guy was a pretty young guy, just 40 years old at the time. Not one of these old lions of Congress who'd been, you know, raising money for all his or her colleagues for decades. It was this 40-year-old guy who got that plum job, not because he'd been around forever and had lots of favors to trade, but because he was seen as such a quality guy. He was seen as such an up-and-comer. And specifically, he had a really detailed, really specific plan. He said that he had the plan for the Republican Party to finally get American debt and deficits under control because he knew how to do it. You put him in charge, he would do it. His reason for living was to cut the debt. It was what he dreamed about. It was what he lived for. It was his life's work. It was all he cared about. It was definitely one thing that he knew how to do better than anybody else. And he had dreamy blue eyes, and he looked awesome alongside blown up charts and graphs. The facts are very, very clear. The United States is heading toward a debt crisis. The only solutions will be truly painful for us all. That doesn't have to be our future. The way we respond to this challenge will ultimately define our generation. We can choose a path to prosperity. Let's take a look at how we can do it. Our debt as a share of the economy is already too high, but look at where it's going. These are actually pretty conservative estimates. Here's what would happen under our proposed budget, what we're calling the path to prosperity. As you can see, we won't come anywhere close to the tipping point and we'll pay off the debt over time. 
the House Republicans' budget man called for dramatic cuts and changes. We put the nation on the path to actually pay off our national debt. 41-year-old Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan is going big compared to the White House budget laid out in February. The Republican plan over the next decade would cut government spending by $6 trillion, reduce the federal deficit by $4.4 trillion compared to the president's budget, according to the Congressional Budget Office. Budget Chairman Congressman Paul Ryan, champion of urgent deep cuts. A 40-year-old congressional rebel with a cause, and John Carl spent the day with him. He's been given more power over the federal budget than anybody in Congress. Paul Ryan, the Republican with the budget axe. 23 million. He's a little like the guy in the movie Dave, the accidental president who sets out to fix the budget line by line. That's another 47 million. So this is good. We're doing good. But in the movie, Dave only has to find $650 million in savings. Ryan wants to cut several trillion over the next 10 years. I mean, how do you go in here and how do you find the kind of savings you want to find? And, and how do you, how do you get your arms I've been reading these like things this? since I was 22 years old. You literally go through it line by line. Direct loans, this is perfect. So direct loans, that's a new spending on autopilot that has no congressional oversight, and it gave the illusion that they were cutting spending. That's the Paul Ryan party trick that he does with reporters. Open the U.S. budget to any page. I'll, I'll find you wasteful spending to cut on any, any page. Oh, look, look at this one. You, know, you thought you're burping the alphabet routine was good, right? Or that thing you do with the chewing tobacco lid? No, no, no. Try opening the budget. Boom, I'd kill that. I mean, yes, there were party poopers out there who pointed out that in that example, in that televised interview, that one random thing Paul Ryan happened to pull out of the budget at random as an example of wasteful spending, that thing is actually something that saved the U.S. government billions and billions and billions of dollars, so cutting it would cost billions of dollars. But still... The idea that he had some sort of budget magic, that he was budget magic personified, it was so exciting, you just didn't want to reveal how the trick was done or that it didn't work. You just wanted to believe in the magic. The Beltway really wanted to believe in the magic. However you felt about Paul Ryan's actual grasp of actual numbers. Uh, by the very next year, that plan of his that he had unveiled uh, was such orthodoxy for Republicans, and he was seen as such a serious policy guy by the mainstream press, that the following year, 2012, Republicans basically, by consensus, chose Paul Ryan as their vice presidential candidate to run with Mitt Romney. Because, you know, yes, dreamy blue eyes and youthful fitness looked great alongside Mitt Romney, uh, but also policy, right? He had that very, very serious plan. He was the policy guy. In choosing Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan as his running mate, Mitt Romney has instantly remade his presidential campaign. Congressman Ryan, the energetic chairman of the House Budget Committee, is the Republican master of all aspects of federal spending, and he comes complete with his own detailed conservative fiscal plan to remake the role of the federal government in everything from Medicare and Medicaid to tax policy and agriculture subsidies. In naming Congressman Ryan, Governor Romney has transformed the presidential campaign into an ideological battle. An ideological battle because Republicans have picked, they called him the Republican master of all aspects of federal spending. Um, there's a, a conservative activist named Grover Norquist, who's an anti-tax crusader. He said at the time that Republicans didn't actually even need Mitt Romney as a presidential candidate. Didn't matter who was at the top of the ticket. All they needed was that magic plan from the Republican master of all aspects of federal spending, Paul Ryan. Grover Norquist said at the time, quote, we want the Ryan budget. Pick a Republican with enough working digits to handle a pen to become president of the United States. All we want is Paul Ryan's magic plan. Well, Paul Ryan did not become vice president in that campaign that he and Mitt Romney lost in 2012. Uh, but while Mitt Romney sort of disappeared for a while um, is now trying to just make his political comeback now, uh, Paul Ryan kept rolling, and he ended up becoming Speaker of the House in 2015. And again, the prevailing view was this meant that the Republican Party would now be led by... Mr. Policy, by the, by the most capable, most devoted policy wonk in all the land, the man whose reason for living was to reduce deficits and the debt, and boy, does he know how to do it. 
Once he was speaker, Paul Ryan started releasing these odd but sort of exciting videos about himself as speaker uh, at the time that they made people think that maybe he was running for president in 2016 or maybe he just liked having videos of himself out there with soaring music and the sound of people applauding him how reassuring it would be if we actually fixed the tax code put patients in charge of their health care grew our economy strengthened our military lifted people out of poverty and paid down our debt the cynics will scoff. They'll say it's not possible. Oh, scoffing cynics who don't believe we will pay down our debt. Don't you know that Paul Ryan has been working on this since he was 22? He has the plan. He's going to bring down the debt. He's going to do all those things. The debt will disappear. This is, this is who Paul Ryan is in American politics. And he's an important figure in American politics. But this is the founding mythology of Paul Ryan over his... 20 years in Congress. And at the beginning of last year, his party finally took control of the White House and the Senate and the House, where he is in charge. And he has a huge majority in the House. He can do what he wants. And with that full control, they have enacted some of Paul Ryan's policies that he has been campaigning for for 20 years. He's finally seen his fiscal plans come into existence. Two days ago, we got the mathematical <laughs> fiscal assessment of the result of those policies. Uh, the deficit is now going to shoot past a trillion dollars by 2020. As a share of the American economy, the deficit is going to reach levels not seen since the economic collapse of 2008. Before that, the last time deficits were this big was World War II, because we were paying for a world war at the time. The debt is going to rise $13 trillion in the next 10 years. That report from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, that came out two days ago. Uh, then this was this morning. Today, I am announcing that this year will be my last one as a member of the House. Uh, to be clear, I am not resigning. I intend to full my served term as I was elected to do. Uh, but I will be retiring in January, leaving this majority in good hands with what I believe is a very bright future. I have accomplished much of what I came here to do. Which part? Um, you may or may not care about the debt and deficit. Some people care a lot about it. Some people don't care about it at all. But getting rid of the debt and the deficit, that is the origin story of why Paul Ryan exists in American politics and, and, and why he's third in line to the presidency. After the president and then the vice president, it's him. It's why he was put in charge of the budget for the Republicans and why they ran him for vice president with Mitt Romney and why they made him Speaker of the House. He will get rid of the debt. And then, then what he did with the power that they gave him once he got to enact his magic plan is that he's going to add $13 trillion to the debt. And, and Paul Ryan apparently looked at that report that came out on Monday afternoon and thought, well, my work here is done. I've pretty much, I've pretty much done what I've... I mean, again, you may or may not care about that as a policy issue, but the, it's, I think it's, this is a, if we're never going to look at this, if, if we're ever going to look at this, this is the time. The Beltway myth of Paul Ryan, which we have all been living through over the course of his political ascendance these past few years, the Beltway myth of Paul Ryan is the opposite of what Paul Ryan did, which should make us examine our myths. Whatever you think of Congressman Ryan, Speaker Ryan, whether you bought into the myth in the first place or not, it is inescapably true that he did the opposite. <laughs> he, he, he failed at achieving the goals that he set for himself from day one and that everybody cheered him on as being capable of achieving as a Republican Party leader. He did the opposite. And now he's leaving, saying he's pretty much done with what he wanted to do. He will be the second Republican House Speaker to quit in the space of three years. His predecessor, John Boehner, stepped down in October 2015. Uh, John Boehner's post-Congress life has seemed kind of awesome, actually. Uh, from what we know about it, it has mostly been him golfing and giving occasional interviews about how relieved he is to not be in terrible Congress anymore. He has occasionally sent out dispatches from his RV on the open road. He wears shorts when he drives been kind of a low-profile retirement for the last Republican Speaker of the House who quit. <laughs> but today turned out to be a really awkward day for everybody in the Beltway media to suddenly turn around and say, hey, I wonder what
what John Boehner is up to right now. We're having another House Speaker quit. What happened to the last one? Today ended up being a very awkward day for everybody to suddenly start wondering about John Boehner again, because early this morning, hours before anybody knew that Paul Ryan was going to announce that he too was leaving, John Boehner announced very early on Twitter today that he was joining the board of a weed company like a marijuana company. John Boehner, former Republican Speaker of the House, chose this morning to come out of the closet as a brand new proponent of legal pot. Quote, I am joining the board of Acreage Holdings because my thinking on cannabis has evolved. Okay, I mean, we all know John Boehner as a proud cigarettes and red wine guy. This is new. When John Boehner shared his evolution his marijuana evolution in that tweet before 7 a.m. this morning, I'm sure he didn't think it was going to be part of every single story about the biggest news in American politics today. But there you have it. Something for Paul Ryan to look forward to now that he's retiring to spend more time probably becoming a lobbyist. I mean, I would pay money to see them high together. At some point, that will probably happen. But it is, it is no mystery. Uh, why Paul Ryan might have wanting might be wanting to, to get out of the way uh, of the November elections this year. That Tea Party wave in 2010, in the first election after Obama was elected president, um, that was the, the 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 wave election that made Paul Ryan budget chair. That was very big. Some of the people who watch these kind of trends for a living, they think this year could bring a Democratic wave that is even bigger than what we saw in 2010. Um, even if you don't believe that hype, and it is still a long way out before the election, it's already clear that it's going to be at least a sort of rough year for Republicans in election after election over the last few months, from state legislative seats to governorships, even to the U.S. Senate. Democrats have been doing way better than they did in 2016, uh, or in some cases, better than they've done in many election cycles going back many years. Uh, Democrats have won upset victories in traditionally conservative places. Hello, Alabama. Um, there have been a number of instances where Democrats have still lost in very conservative places, but the percentage swing toward Democrats in those elections has nevertheless been huge. Uh, just yesterday, we kind of had a couple of specials. Uh, a Democrat won a Florida Senate race, state Senate race. She won her race by a 50-point margin. And yeah, that's a Democratic district in Florida, so maybe not surprising that a Democrat won. But Hillary Clinton crushed that district in 2016. Hillary Clinton won that district by 25 points. This is a 25-point swing further toward the Democrats in that race yesterday, a 50-point margin. Also yesterday, there was another special in Iowa. In Iowa, a Republican won a state Senate seat in a, in a very red district, but that Republican won by 14 fewer points. Then Trump had won that district in 2016. So it's a 14-point swing in Democrats' direction, even in, a, even in a race they could still hold on to. These kind of swings are real, and we have been seeing them for well over a year now. And if they persist, even at a fraction of what we're seeing now, they will make it very hard for Republicans this November. Not to mention the fact that every Republican in America will be running with Donald Trump as their party's standard bearer. Maybe Paul Ryan could have been the standard bearer before he quit, but it's going to be Donald Trump. And that will doubtless help some Republicans in some places that really love Donald Trump. At the rate things are going right now, though, it is hard to imagine what amount and what manner of scandal and legal peril may be hanging over Trump and his administration by the time voters are actually going to the polls and voting in November. We just learned today that as of last week, the Russia Legal Defense Fund for the Trump campaign staffers and Trump administration staffers is open for business and taking donations. So maybe that could be kind of a joint election message. Maybe that could be like, hey, vote for me. Or if you don't have time to go out and vote, please, could you contribute to the Russia legal defense? Happy election season, GOP. We'll be right back. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.